the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. All right, now we talked about the Apostle Paul, and one of the things that's kind of difficult for people to understand is, is that it does matter um, how you live. Leave your finger right there in 1 Thessalonians and come over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And let me show you something. Now, this is not lifestyle witnessing like many people try to make it out to be. That's not what this is. But what the Apostle Paul does is he said, it doesn't matter how loud you talk if the walk doesn't match the talk. Um, so, for instance, I don't, I've used the illustration before, but you go to a, a, a car place and the guy's trying to sell you, oh, let's just say, what's a benign car, a Chevrolet. And he's trying to sell you a Chevrolet and, and that kind of a deal. And you say, well, let me ask you a question. This is the greatest car since sliced bread and does everything in the world but cook breakfast for you. And yes, yeah, the greatest car in the world. Got a great deal today. You can buy this and that and the other. Okay, can I ask you a question? Sure, anything. Sky's the limit. Help yourself. What question do you have to ask me? What kind of car do you drive? You watch his jaw drop. He's trying to sell you something he doesn't even drive himself. Oh, well, I drive a Toyota. Well, why are you selling Chevrolets? Now, you're, you're telling me that the Chevrolet is the best car to drive, but you're driving a Toyota. Now, I know that probably sounds like a silly illustration, but part of the issue that happens, ladies and gentlemen, with Christianity, and this is across the board with religion in general, people watch more how you live than what you say. And if you get ready to witness to somebody and you have a track record, you say, well, the gospel overcomes all that. No, it doesn't. People watch that stuff. Well, preacher, you know about hypocrites and this and that and the other. I'm not talking about everybody else. I'm talking about you. Amen. I'm talking about how people perceive you. When you hit the judgment seat of Christ, honestly, do you think that when you get there, the Lord's going to say, I'm glad, so glad you're here. It's so good to see you. I've been wanting to ask your opinion on these people that are here. And then call up your friends. That Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, you say, what is that? You know all it took when the Lord looked at Peter, when Peter denied the Lord, you know all it took when the Lord came out there? He just turned and looked at him. And the Bible said, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. Can you imagine when those eyes as a flame of fire look at you? and you get called into account, do you think at that moment that you're going to say, well, Lord, that may be true about me, but did you see him? And did you see her? So what I'm trying to do is give you something that will help you here to realize Christianity should not be something that you do, act, or perform. It should be what you are. You're saved. Your soul is saved. And as a result of your soul being saved, we're trying to work out the thing on the inside to get it to the outside. And if you don't do that, you're going to have a difficult time. And that, believe it or not, is a reason why some people don't care anything about witnessing to people. They don't want to have to live the life that's required for them to live after they witness to somebody. That's why you don't witness to your coworkers. Because you can't stand around the water cooler and tell some of the jokes. That's why you don't witness to your classmates. Because they see you after class and running around going to places you shouldn't be. They see you at the party. Amen. They see you guys at uh, Hooters. Come on, preacher. Hmm. Make it plain. And you just told them about Jesus. Yeah, right. And then they see you getting with a bunch of people and eating wings and drinking horse urine. Right. Come on. Right. And that kind of thing. For those of you visiting, that's beer. You say, well, no, you know, that's what it is. Some of you are still looking at me strange. I know we have a bunch of visitors here. Have you ever seen a horse relieve himself? You see how yellow it is and how much it foams? I pray that that sticks in your mind the way it did in mine when, my, when I asked my dad, the first time I ever asked him about it, I said, Dad, what's a beer? And he said, see a horse over there, boy? I said, yes, sir. He said, see what he's doing right now? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's beer. I was see, man, my daddy couldn't tell no lies, man. I mean, I thought my dad was, you know, was next to God. Like, here's God and here's, you know, my dad. And so I'm like, so for years I thought, so we walked through one day. I used to, my, the bag was as big as me. I used to carry the clubs for him. And I'm walking through, and we're going through at the turn. And we walked through there to get some uh, chocolate milk and a pack of crackers. And I look on the table, and there's a bunch of guys around the table playing cards in there. And I said, Dad, they're drinking horse and I use a different word than urine. And, and they all looked at him. He goes, come on, son, let's go. <laughs> I walked out of there. 
You say, what a, what a dumb thing. Oh, I don't know, man. I had that stuck in my mind that every time I saw that stuff with the foam on top, I'm kind of like, why would anybody want to drink? Yes. Now, you, your, your attitude nowadays is, is this a little bit too relaxed when it comes to the life that you live. You never find that in the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul practiced and walked what he talked. And that's what's important. Christians don't like what I'm going to give you this morning. They don't appreciate you. Say what? It calls you into account. What do you think is going to happen in eternity when the Lord calls you up there at the judgment seat of Christ that are saved? What do you, what do you think it's going to be like? Why? In every place in the Bible, he doesn't mention anything about hell. He says the terror of the Lord. Why do you think that is? What if the Lord were to go up there and unroll your record after you were saved? and show you everything you didn't do. When those eyes as a flame of fire hit you, it burns up all your bad works and stuff. And man, you probably feel the heat coming off of that. And then all that stuff's laid out there and the Lord's looking at you the whole time saying, this is what you could have done, this is what you could have done, and this is what you didn't do. Amen. Well, I'm not going to witness out of fear. Well, come on, let's be honest. You're not going to witness anyway. <laughs> don't, 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 don't make it like somebody's holding a gun to your head. You know why you don't witness? You don't want to. <laughs> it's that simple. God hadn't really done enough for you to tell other people about it. Amen. And you get put, you don't, you don't, you have no idea how close to eternity you might be. You have no idea. And you make decisions as if you're going to be around another 30 or 40 years. And God might call you into account tomorrow. I talked to a young lady this morning about a couple of things, and I said the strange thing is, is that when you get there uh, all of a sudden to the end of life and something happens along the way that becomes an emergency, everything you did, everything you thought, all the plans you made, everything, all that stuff, it's gone. You got to take care of the problem right then. Yes, sir. Yes. Everything you thought was going to occur has all stops. You say, why? You're laying in the hospital, hanging in the, in between life and death. Now, if a Christian would learn to do that and realize you may not get another chance, you're not going to hear me teach or preach this stuff to you that if you don't tell somebody, then God's going to hold you accountable for it. Listen, if you won't tell them, God will find some way to tell them. God doesn't depend on man. That's why Romans 1 said, even nature itself will tell them. If you don't tell them, God will find a way to get it to them. He's not willing that any should perish. Don't, don't make yourself so important that God gives you a chance. I'm not going to put you under that and put a gun to your head. Oh, if you don't tell them, they're going to go to heaven. and God's going to hold you accountable. You're not, you're, you're not accountable for them. You're not the atonement for them. It's your job to tell them. But if you don't want to tell them, he'll find somebody else. Amen. Amen. Old preacher, I just, you know, is it that, it's that simple. Paul lives this kind of life. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, and we had talked about this, about not quitting and being bold in God and, and those kind of things, and not to have uh, 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 things that are going the way that you wouldn't think would be going the right way. Paul says this in verse number 2, I'm sorry, 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, that we have received mercy, we what? That's exactly what he said over there, continuing bold in God. We don't quit. You say, what? Because there's something more important than whatever you're living now. You have to learn to live for eternity, ladies and gentlemen. Eternity, 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 eternity. It's a, like I told you, the fellow goes up there and he says, Lord, I'm glad to be here. What's eternity like for you? And he said, well, he said, well, how do you measure time? And he said, oh, well, a second up here is like, you know, a thousand years. And he said, wow. He said, well, what about money? He said, oh, well, a penny's worth a... Oh, about a million dollars. And the fellow said, well, can I borrow a penny? And the Lord said, well, in a second. <laughs> Eternity. That's where you're going to live forever. Not 60, 70 years or, in, for instance, my mom's case a couple of weeks ago, 94 years. The wonderful long life. That's a great thing. Her dad, 96 years. That's a wonderful, well, the last few years weren't so wonderful, but that's a wonderful long life. You're not guaranteed that. I mean, you talk to the people around here that are in EMTs and doctors and nurses and all the other kind of stuff. You talk to all of the individuals that are out here handling that. You know what they know? They know people die in the crib as much as they die of old age in a nursing home. You don't know when you're going to die. 
when God decides when he's going to punch your ticket. The question is, is are you ready to have your ticket punched? Are you ready to face the judgment? I mean, you're saved. You think what he's going to do, ladies and gentlemen, you think he's going to look at what your budget is? Don't tell me you're not afraid. You are afraid. You're absolutely afraid. How many of you have car insurance? Why? Are you afraid you're going to have a wreck? Are the police going to pick you up because you don't have it's a required in the state of Florida? How many of you have hospitalization? You better have it. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you're talking bills come in at a hundred grand a, a, a time now. You walk into the ER, walk out, and there's 20,000 bucks gone. All right. You have fire insurance, flood insurance, homeowner's insurance, life insurance. What you scared of? Come on, what you afraid of? Life's pretty simple. I'll give you something wise right now, even coming from me. A life, it boils down to this, knowing when to be afraid and when not to be afraid. If you're afraid of things you shouldn't be afraid of, you're a fool. And if you're not afraid of things you shouldn't be afraid of, or that you should be afraid of, you're a fool. That Bible says, fear him that can cast body and soul into hell. Do you fear him? I preached for over a month on fear of God. Did it change your life? Amen. Or are you still living the kind of life that pleases yourself? You got ready to throw in the towel and quit because stuff got a little hard? That's life. You know what that does? It has a tendency to taint, to dim, to turn the lights down on things on this earth. One of the things I do like about old age, I don't like a lot of things. There was a funeral yesterday and, and uh, my, my niece's father-in-law passed away. Back a bajillion years ago, was a policeman down there where I was and all the stuff that went on that you do with that kind of a deal. And somebody said they're going through an old friend of mine I hadn't seen in 20 years or better. Hey man, how you doing? Remember? I said, yeah, I remember you. How are you doing? And called him by name and so on and so forth. He said, man, wouldn't you like to turn back the hands of time? I said, heavens, no. I wouldn't want to go back and come back through again for nothing. I just soon kick the bucket right now is to give back me up 10 years. One of the things I like about old age is, is it makes you realize that no matter how great a shape you were in, somebody went up, saw a picture from about a million years ago and said, what happened to them guns, you know? And I said, I don't carry a gun anymore. No, I'm talking about the other ones. I said, uh, they're spaghetti now. <laughs> you start getting old and you realize no matter how great a shape you think you're in, all of a sudden things you got, if it ain't hurting, it ain't working. Amen. Kind of that pain's good. You say, what? Well, it's good. It's still working. It hurts to move it. <laughs> But one of the things I like about old age is, is it has a tendency to turn the light down on life, Amen. on things of this earth. Amen. They work all these years to get all this stuff. And then as you get older, you start looking around and think, I got to protect all this stuff. And then you start getting older and say, I don't even need this stuff. <laughs> and then you're thinking, oh, as long as I got a room and somebody to cook meals or something, I, uh, old age has a tendency to put your eyes in the right place. You're getting ready to kick the bucket. If the rapture doesn't happen, everybody under the sound of my voice is going to check out of here one day. Amen. We're going to put you in a box right down here. And people are going to come by and say, don't he look natural? <laughs> That's what they say. People say the stupidest thing. Don't he look natural? Did he look like that when he was alive? No wonder he's dead. <laughs> that ain't how you look. All pasty colored and all that kind of stuff. Ashen colored. I don't care how dark you are, man. Once they pump that blood out of you, you'll kind of turn from black to sort of beige. You know, it's kind of what happened, man. You say, what is that? That's blood in you is gone. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Don't get nervous. You say, what happens? In death, everybody's equal. You dead. You don't look like that when you're dead. They dress you up in a suit or dress you up in your finest clothes, you know. We put mama in such and such and this and that and the other. And uh, doesn't she look natural laying there with her hands folded, you know, looking like that and doesn't paint over all the age spots. You try to make them look like they're something they're not. They're dead. Yeah. Right. And they walk by there and they look at that corpse. And what you don't ever think, that could be me one day. 
what are you doing for eternity? One of the things I like about getting old is, is you start realizing that some of the stuff you get so jacked up and worried about, the second you step from this life to the other, or when you step into a triage at a hospital, all of a sudden, all of that stuff doesn't make a mount to a row of pins. You're right. Amen. Amen, preacher. And all the things that's ruining your life right now, all of a sudden, just like that, the Lord said, what's really important? Amen. And you know what you're going to think? Man, I wasted all that time and all that brain space worrying about stuff I had. Just it, it don't amount to anything. The old preacher used to say, and he got it from another preacher. He said, "Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last." Do you believe that? Well, what are you doing, you young people in here? What are you doing? You gonna get to it one day, are you? Clock's going to run out on some of you. Amen. Rapture's going to happen, and some of you think you're going to live to be an old man like me. You're thinking to yourself, oh, well, I got plenty of time. I'm going to be an old man, and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, the Lord blows the horn, man. They <coughs> let off that 21 gun salute yesterday, and I thought, man, listen for that trumpet. And then, of course, it happened to be taps, but I'm thinking, I was hoping it was the, you know, da 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 the permanence of death. And you get up there and you're either in heaven and hell, one or the other. No in between, no purgatory. And now all of a sudden you get up there and you look at your life and you take a, you, you take a review of your life. And you say, what, what was I doing down there? I just lived for myself? Took the things that God gave me and just lived for myself? Okay, well, good. You had a comfortable life here. You got your reward. You get up there to heaven and thank God you, you're saved. Enter into the joy of the Lord. <laughs> and for eternity, that's where you're going to be. Everybody won't be the same in eternity. You'll have a glorified body. You'll be in heaven with Jesus. Now, let me just say something to you. I'm, I'm going to get to this in just a second. But you're a hypocrite if you think that's okay with you because it's not enough down here. Down here, you always got to have something newer and better. Down here, you always have to improve. You always want another job. You want another thing. You want to make more money. You want to have more security. You want this and that and the other. You start getting older and you're, you start thinking about, well, I can afford this now and afford this now and afford this now. Is your life in Christ growing the same rate? I don't care if you got all that. I don't care if you own the stinking Taj Mahal. I don't care. Invite me. I'll come eat dinner with you. I don't care. Take me to the nicest place in the world. I, that, that, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying if that's all you think there is in life, you're missing a life in Christ. And only what's done for Christ will last. You can get up there and the Lord said, oh, okay, I don't care about all that stuff. It don't make any difference to me. Well, you know, I drove a Mercedes and the Lord said, okay, we don't drive that over here. We're self-transported. We just think it and we're there. We don't have to have something battery powered or we don't have something gas powered or something water powered or whatever it might be. Oh, Lord, you know, I flew here and I flew there. Well, you just think it here and you're there. I'm not impressed with your miles at all. They might have given you status because of the miles you flew, meaning the money. That equates to meaning the money you spent. That's what that really means. That's to keep you on the hook, to keep you spending more money. And the Lord looks up there and says, we don't have frequent flyer miles here. You don't have status by the size of your mansion there. Amen. You have status by what you did for the one that saved you. Amen. Are you doing anything? You spend all your time just criticizing other Christians? Come on, preacher. That's, that's, that's all you have. I mean, after what the Lord did for you, that's all you have to talk about is everybody that ain't. Come on, good. What's the matter? Am I stepping on your toes this morning? He must be tired. He's, he's been out west and he's been, I've been home since Friday night. I'm doing fine. <clears throat> I even have notes on it. How you live matters, ladies and gentlemen. And everyone's equitable there. Look at Paul after he says we faint not. Look in verse number two. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. 
Oh, have you? I don't know. Paul said they had. Or do you still kind of cut the corners here and there? You know, the little hand-sized brim you caught all of a sudden's. You've announced the, the hidden things of dishonesty. Are you honest when you start talking about other people? Do you know all the facts? Are you sure you know the facts? Or do you know the facts as you perceive them? Dishonesty. You say, what happened? Every one of us will perceive things in a different fashion. And if you're not careful to get the facts, I like, I call it the Joe Friday syndrome. So most of you won't even know who that is. There used to be a thing on there. It wasn't one Adam 12. It was uh, uh, another thing. And they had a ball headed guy. And then they had a guy named Friday. What was his name of it? Dragnet. Dragnet. That was it. <laughs> And it, it was Joe Friday, and you know what he'd say? Uh, the, the lady would start going off and talking and this and that and the other. He'd say, just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. You renounce the hidden things of dishonesty? I'm going to put a question to you. Are you a Christian? Amen. Do people know that, or are you dishonest when you make that claim? Oh. I didn't say you weren't saved, washed in the blood, praise the Lord, going home to heaven if you die today or the rapture happens. I didn't say that. I said, do they know you as a Christian or are you one thing out there and another thing in here? Dishonesty. Paul didn't make uh, uh, any, any uh, lies about those things. He said, we've renounced those things. Now watch. Not walking in craftiness. Trickery. I was at a place not long ago and the fellow got up and he was uh, talking to some kids and stuff. And I think that's a good thing. I guess you'd say a mentorship or something. Uh, and he was a speaker at this particular thing. And he said, uh, you know, I failed uh, my college class five times. I changed my major, he said, five times. And uh, I, I thought, well, that's not a, I guess you could say maybe that he's diligent, but you got to kind of wonder to yourself, you failed it five times, man. I mean, is that really showing a good work ethic? I changed it five times. You're a little unstable as water, aren't you? But then watch how the thing goes. But then I found out I could get a degree in half the time if I just got a degree in marketing. And surprisingly, I got the degree in marketing. And now guess what I do? I'm in the ministry and I market Jesus. I mean, after all, isn't that what we do? No, that's not what you do. Amen. You're not marketing Jesus, selling him. What kind of foolishness is that? Have dancing girls jumping out of an airplane, an elephant walking through here and have a strongman contest or something for the chance to purvey the God. We're not marketing anything. Hey, listen, the product you have right there sells itself. You have to put on some kind of a sales show, marketing. You can hear it when guys are preaching sometimes. It's kind of like, man, what? You didn't go to a preaching class. Preachers don't talk like that. Right. Sound like you've been going to a Tony Robbins or a Zig Ziglar class. You ought to be able to pick that stuff out. You combine those things. You say, well, it's just a talk. It ain't talking. It's never called talking. It's called preaching. Amen. And preaching's supposed to stick you every now and then. Amen. Paul said, when we came and when it came to preaching, I'm getting to this in just a second in 1 Thessalonians 2, but I get to this thing and I, I'm, I'm telling you this because there's a lot of new folks that are here. And you come here and you think, I'm going to get up here and I'm going to have my shirt turned around backwards and I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to read and you're not going to have a book to check me with. And you think I'm going to keep my voice down and I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to be calm and I'm, going to, I'm just going to give you something that's not going to put you under conviction or anything like that. I'm just have you step in here and, and come as you were and leave, I mean, come as you are and leave as you were. That's not what church is for. Amen. And these people will holler amen or they'll throw a hanky up or they'll stand up during a song service or they come down here at an altar. You're like, well, that's just too much for me. Like one fellow told the preacher one time, he said, you know, he said, have you ever been to uh, the church over here? He said, no. He said, I don't go there for a reason. He said, why? He said, because they're always trying to make you feel bad about yourself. <laughs> I had parents like that. I had parents not trying to always make me feel bad, but when I was bad, 
They wanted me to feel bad. Amen. I mean, and I appreciate it now. Yes. I appreciate it at all. <laughs> and I come to church and it's kind of like, well, I'm, I'm a good person. I know the guy's lying to me. I know me. I am not a good person. It's just your standard of measurement. You imagine getting to the judgment seat of Christ, Ecclesiastes 12, and every secret thing is revealed unto God. God knows everything about you, and you just have Him look at you. Just look at you. Knowing He knows everything. You can't hide from Him. You can't jellyfish. You can't make it out to be something it's not. He's just looking at you the whole time. And everywhere you get ready to turn or whatever, Lord, He's already got you blocked. And He said, you're going to come clean now. How about the hidden things of dishonesty? How about not walking in craftiness, not trying to trick people? How about handling nor handling the Word of God deceitfully? Paul preached it like it was. That doesn't mean you have to be, when he, Paul says rude in speech, he wasn't foul talking. Paul was very well trained. He was a lawyer. He was trained at the feet there of Aga, Aga, uh, the... Uh, uh, it just Gamil slipped my mind there for a second. And he's down there and, and Paul knew how to talk. I mean, Paul could address doctors and lawyers. Paul didn't get up there and act like a hick in front of people when he's talking that way. When he says rude in speech, he means plain talking so that everyone could get it. Well, let me ask you a question just out of curiosity. Do you have an ability for people to understand what you're trying to say to them? Or do you talk over their head? Or do you talk so low they'd have to get in the gutter to hear you? <laughs> Has your speech improved? Has your speech improved? Imagine if the Lord were to talk to you the way you talk about other people. I'm sorry, I was just taking you at your word. You said your speech improved. How about handling the Word of God deceitfully? I know individuals that quote Bible verses and they don't have any more God in it than a billy goat even though they came from the Bible and they use that to try to justify doing things to other people. Amen. I've seen them take a Bible like that right there and put people under their thumb in the name of God. Amen. In the name of religion. And use a Bible to do it. Amen. You say, what is that? You're handling the Word of God wrong. Then notice what he says, not deceitfully, but manifestation of truth. How do I manifest it? It's how I walk. That passage in 2 Corinthians 5, which is right across the page over there, the terror of the Lord is warning a Christian to live right because you're going to get called into account for it. The terror of the Lord is, that's the judgment seat. That's not the great white throne. We're going to talk about that this morning. That's telling us as Christians, there's a day coming where we're going to face God and give an account for how we lived after we were saved. Amen. I realize I'm a dinosaur right now. I realize I'm a trumpeting elephant right now. I realize and completely understand people don't want to hear this stuff. Well, that's just old school, old fashioned stuff. You're deceitful. It's old school and old fashioned, but it's right school. Amen. And it's still right to do right whether you're living in a modern time or not. I'm not going to get brought under that. You say, why? Because we need that nowadays. Nowadays it's the gospel of compromise. Oh, just let it go. Just let it ride. Don't even think that big of a deal. Don't worry about it. Chill out. Relax. People dying and going to hell and you're supposed to be the light shining, not being under a bushel. Committing ourselves to, uh-oh, to what? To what? You mean I'm supposed to live for the benefit of other people? Was what he said. I don't care what they think of me. That ain't what he said. That is not what he said. He said commending myself to everyone's conscience, worrying about what they think of you. I'm wore out with preachers who are not under submission at all, not under subjection. You say, what? I'm in subjection to you. You say, but you're the pastor. You're the preacher. I'm not a dictator. I'm in subjection to you. I have to live my life for your conscience sake. That means if somebody spits on the bottom of their shoe and rubs it in my face, I have to take it for your conscience. How you view me matters. I'm a servant. I'm not the boss. 
I'm supposed to serve. That's what is that? That's old school, never taught anymore. Amen. I ain't living my life for somebody else. I don't care what anybody else, bob that stinking head, and throw that finger. I, ain't, I don't care what anybody says to me. Well, you're not much of a Christian then. Because a Christian lives his life, Romans 14, I'll show you in a minute, for the benefit of the weaker brother. And if he is going to be offended by whatever I do, even if I'm allowed to do it, I don't do it. Well, I got liberty. Yeah, liberty that I don't have to do it for his benefit. You live your life for the benefit of other people that are watching you. But who wants to hear about that? You want to talk about everything else in church from buildings to finances and programs and special stuff, you never pause to think. The life in Christ is the one that has lived for the benefit of other people that are weaker than you, that don't know what you know, and they're looking at you to set an example. The idea of personal liberty to be utilized how you want to utilize it, when you want to utilize it, is not a biblical principle at all. You never live your life for yourself. Amen. Preacher, we're just starting to get some people coming in, thinking about putting in a balcony now already, and, and now you've got to come in here and do that. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? Paul said, when we came and preached to you, we weren't deceitful. What? They could see the change in Paul. Can they see the change, the change in you? I'm not talking about people sitting in here. They all think you're a Christian, a good Christian, because you're sitting in here. And you're all foo fooed up and got all your foo foo juice and all that kind of stuff. And you walk by, you smell like a perfume factory. Amen. And you've got your new do going and that kind of thing. You got on your new chimney shoes and that kind of, got on, got, you know, you're doing, you're doing great. And everybody looks at you and say, oh boy, what a great Christian. You know what the Lord does? He watches you Monday morning at work. Amen. He listens to your conversation around the, co the cooler and the coffee pot. He watches you at lunchtime. You know, when you take your secretary out Come on. for a business meeting, <laughs> you know how that is, right? I mean, you know, just, you know, they're, they're, they're on up there in the company. You got to have a little private time. They make offices with glass doors on them for that. Amen. Eating with somebody's intimate. Yes. Yes. Don't even get me started. But I know, I know how the, that's, the, that's the business world nowadays. Yeah, and your wife's at home washing your dirty underwear and washing your dirty Come socks on. and cleaning up after you and fixing Come up on. after you and comes to the front door like the wreck of the Hespers because she's been taking care of the kids and stuff. And you stinking pinhead, you've been out there running around like a wild dog. Amen. Good preaching. Hey. Honey, can't you do something to yourself? Yeah, and get away from you, you... Pinhead. <laughs> you say, what is that? You're misstepping what Paul says. You say, what is that? That woman God gave you, gave to you as a gift. Amen. And if Galatians 6 is right, you're going to be judged, boys, by how you treat the gift he gave you. Amen. Are you her spiritual leader? Or are you her confidant where you can just talk about everything to abate your conscience so you can stay at the house when you ought to be at the church. Come on. Come on, preacher. And ruin your kids. That's it. Okay. That's good. Men say they want preaching. Come on. Yes, sir. Amen. You say, well, how hard is it to live with a woman? Hey, she's not the woman you dated and you know it and you ain't the man you were when she dated you either. The Bible says you have to dwell with her according to knowledge. Amen. Right. It's a learning process constantly. Yeah. Yeah. You say, why? She's different. God said you better study her. Yeah. Right. But you'd rather replace her. <laughs> you don't have the character anymore. to be a Christian man and set an example by being here in church. That's women stuff, ain't it, boys? That's, that's for the women. Let the women do the religious stuff. We'll see. 
We'll see. You'll see the real judge of manhood. You know what he says in the book of Acts? <clears throat> the book of Acts, he'll tell you that you're going to be judged by that man, the one that resurrected from the dead there. You know what that means? That you're going to get your life compared to his. I realize you can walk up here. You can walk up on the platform in front of everybody and body slam me and probably break my full neck and kill me dead. Most of you big old bulls in here can do all kinds. You can whoop me physically, but you ain't got enough character to fill a thimble. Amen. You're going to get in everybody else's business and do everything because you're God's gift to whatever you think you are. I'm talking to the men right now, which there is very little I've left anymore. Your blood's pink. You don't need a rainbow to represent that. You don't have red blood in you anymore. I ain't talking about you being able to, whether you can change a tire or not. I'm talking about, can you be faithful to Jesus Christ and the family God gave you? You ain't got no courage for that. It's all you do is complain all the time. Well, my wife this, well, my wife, well, hey, stupid, you married her. That Bible says when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Maybe the reason she ain't rejoicing is because the righteous ain't ruling. Two-tone hypocrite, just because you still quote right. Jesus wept and John 3, 16, you think you're spiritual. You're spiritual by the example you set. Right. Amen. I wore out with that. You young bucks, you had no idea. You just chirp off at all these old people. You just chirp, chirp, yep. chirp, you know, all that kind of a stuff like that. Like you think you got a corner on the market and things have changed. I was a young buck once. Mm -hmm. yep. I know what it's like to all of a sudden not think anything about the old white-headed people that have gone the way and they know things you don't know. You know more than they do, don't they? Don't you? Come on, preacher. Well, we'll see if you can wind up staying married 40, 50, 60 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. How come it is per capita your marriages are falling apart? Because right. you ain't got no character anymore, yeah, that's why. Yeah, yeah. Ain't got no. Right. Oh. Good yeah. Yeah. You don't have the character to fill a thimble. I watch these old men around here and they pick up stuff and work and pick up and paint and, and grab a broom and sweep and get a, 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 a scrubby and clean out a toilet and stuff like that. And you go, ooh, ooh, I don't want, that might get dust on my shoes. I don't, I, I don't, I, I didn't come here to do that. Come on, preach it, preach it. I, I, you know what? I'd be willing to bet you. I'd be willing to bet you at the house. I bet you got a hole in your roof and a hole in your wall. I bet you got a dirty carpet. I bet your car's oil ain't been changed or nothing else. That's all women stuff, ain't it, boys? Come on, preacher. So you don't need to be preaching that stuff to me. Why are you under conviction? Amen. That ain't the Bible. I got ten Bible verses to back mine up. Can you back up one for being lazy? I watched old men crawling around on roofs and stuff like that. And I watched a bunch of young guys going, man, I don't, I don't know if I could do that. That man's 55 years old. Why ain't you up there? Amen. That man's 60 years old. How come you ain't up there? Right. Well, old men, they don't have nothing else to do. <laughs> if them old men don't do anything, there won't be nothing left for you young men to do. You forget that you go out there and you're standing on the work of seven years of hard labor out there before you got to do anything. Amen. Somebody paid a price for you to be where you are right now. You're just getting in on the end. You better not forget where you came from. Amen. See, what is that? That's called character. You better appreciate these old people. You're going to be up the creek with no means of motivation when them old people gone. Think you know it all. My aching back, you think you know it all. Paul says this, I got to quit right now. Every man's conscience in the sight of God, but if our gospel be hid, is hid to them that are lost. Paul's going to go down through that passage. I never even got back to 1 Thessalonians. I'll get there tonight, but, I, I, but you know, Paul comes back there. You know what he says? He said, hey, you got to be living. You say, why? Well, people are dying and going to hell, and they're watching you. There's a lot of sense in what that old woman I used to live with used to say, and I say that respectfully. Nowadays, to me, when I say the word old, I mean that as respectful as I possibly can be because they made it to the end of their life and still going up the mountain. Amen. Amen. When I say old man and still see saints serving the Lord like Miss Penny and like my mama and some other people that I knew and go out and go out the right way, I mean that with great respect. And Paul said, that old, I mean, that old woman said, when she shuffled down that hallway, make me that frozen jello with a fruit cocktail out of a can in it, freeze it, full of sugar, man. 
and like eating little bites of candy, you know, and uh, red jello. And she'd come down there and she's, I got some frozen jello. Yes, ma'am, I'm getting ready to go off. I'm, I'm going to do, do so and so and, and that kind of thing. But, well, okay, well, it's in the freezer if you'd like it. I, I made it special for you, watching you. <laughs> watching you. There's an all seeing eye watching you. Don't forget to lock the door when you leave now, watching you. I, I ain't going nowhere. I'll be out there in just a minute. <laughs> Go ahead and set that jello out. The Lord's watching you. You know what bothers me? It don't bother you. Or you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. You preach this six or eight weeks on the fear of God and your life hadn't changed at all. You're just bullheaded. Mavericks. I'm going to do what I want. You got your own form of Christianity. You have your own religion. You could go start your own religion while you run down the Muslims and everybody else. You got your own religion. You got Saul's religion. I'll do what I want to do. I'm rewriting that that ain't really what the Bible says. Okay. We'll see one day. Yeah. Amen. I was told a story one time. I got to close here. I told a story one time of a guy. A matter of fact, the old preacher's one told me this. And he said he, he told it as it was an illustration he got from somebody else. I don't know if it's true or not. But he came back from off the mission field and his heart was burdened for people. And he got up in front of his people and he said, uh, I want to preach to you about something, but it's probably not going to get past the first statement. And he said, uh, the whole world is out there going and people all around this church are dying and going to hell. And you people don't give a, and he cursed. He used the D word. And then he paused while everybody sucked the oxygen out of the room. That preacher just said, and he said, and you know what bothers me? He said, most of you are more worried about me saying that word than you are about people going to hell. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you old hypocrite, you. Amen. Curse and swear like a sailor and talk about other people like nobody's business. And you get upset because a preacher uses a word to make an illustration. You don't care about them people going to hell. You care about you. You care about you. That's why you won't fall in line. It's about you. You can't tolerate people. You're not like Christ at all. You're the problem. I'm the problem. He's not the problem. Father, bless your word this morning.